And our findings indicated that the overwhelming majority of force, almost 90 percent, is directed against African Americans. Now, this deeply alarming statistic points to one of the most pernicious aspects of the conduct that our investigation uncovered, that these policing practices disproportionately harm African American residents. Attorney General Eric Holder detailing uh, some of the problems faced by the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department. We're back now in America's Forum with Miranda Kahn, J.D. Hayworth, and Miranda, uh, General Holder's Justice Department found there was widespread discrimination within the Ferguson Police Department. Yeah, especially through some emails. Uh, Holder is now calling for leaders in that city to take immediate action to fix the problem, or the feds are threatening to step in and make them do it. Uh, joining us now for more on the story, Thomas Ruskin, former New York Police Department detective and president of CMP Protective and Investigative Group Incorporated. Tom, thanks for checking in from a snowy New York there at, New, at Newsmax, New York. Good morning, J.D. So, we heard from the Attorney General uh, legitimate grievances or a notion of social justice to almost set up quotas for law enforcement. Well, and what you're going to do is you're going to handcuff police officers, not only in Ferguson, but around this country. So what you have to look at is in any city where you have a makeup, predominantly of minorities, of course you're going to be arresting more minorities, and of course you're going to be questioning more minorities, and of of course, the majority of the crimes that are committed are going to be minority on minority oh. crime. That doesn't mean that the police are racist, and it doesn't mean that police departments aren't doing what they are paid to but do. But Tom, but Tom, I, I hear what you're saying. You're right, but the but the police force itself wasn't made out of the majority of them being minorities. Right, and that and, and that's and what police departments have to do, and that. Yes, yeah, some of the emails are quite disturbing and should never have happened. And authorities and police officials and city officials have to take actions. But that does happen as well in private corporations. You would not want to read the email chains on a Wall Street financial firm back and forth and back and forth. But a police department has to be held to a higher standard. And to Miranda, to your point, which is a very good question, officials have to take steps that that doesn't happen and there, there isn't a perception behind the scenes of of some kind of racial you know bias right but the, but they weren't discouraged to to make these comments in fact they weren't even disciplined right. until now i mean well, some of the emails are happened. referring it to the president I... as a chimpanzee as a chimp right. our own president well, it's it, it's t it's totally inappropriate but we had the president of Sony Pictures also refer to the president in a derogatory way. It's unacceptable. In, in a world where we're such a melting pot in this country, we have to have much more sensitivity to the different races and the different cultures of different people, and police departments have to be held to that standard as well. And, of course, the mayor of Ferguson, now that these things came to light, there's been at least one dismissal. But I'm wondering, what does the future portend, Tom? Will we see the Department of Justice try to micromanage what happens with that department in Ferguson? Will they set up their own arbitrary quotas to have a majority-minority police force? I, I would certainly hope not. But listen, any police department nowadays, if I was running the police department or if I was a city official, you have to look to diversify your police departments. And you have to have it somewhat reflective of the population of your community. And if you don't, then you possibly could come under this type of scrutiny. God, God help them if they don't take corrective action to bring in more minorities, as New York City did years and years ago. In the early 80s, they did exactly that. They had an A list and a B list relative to promotion and hiring in New York City. And it did diversify the police department. So that's something the police departments, as well as Ferguson, are going to have to do. And uh, mindful of that, Tom Ruskin, we know there are a whole lot of other items on the law enforcement agenda. And Tom, we're going to ask you to stay right there because we want to continue this conversation. And we hope you'll stay right where you are, right here on America's Forum, as it continues from Newsmax TV. 
Back now on America's Forum with Miranda Khan, J.D. Hayworth. Miranda, there's always an interesting situation trying to balance individual rights and law and order issues. and it's that's tough. It it's can very, be. very, very, very fine and line. And we've got a slice of real life, some stories, uh, yeah. and uh, it's time now to continue our conversation with Tom Ruskin, former New York police detective and president of CMP Protective and Investigative Group. Uh, so... We have a situation, Tom, where the Patrolman's Benevolent Association is up in arms this morning following new regulations for stop and frisk. The president of that organization, Pat Lynch, says the rules are so restrictive that cops should, quote, travel with an attorney. Is it really that bad? Well, I haven't read the new policy that's just come out. But basically what you're doing again is you're handcuffing the police and you're taking the step to the other side where you're not allowing police to be police. There is a, there is a legitimate purpose to stop, question, and frisk. And it's not stop and frisk, it's stop, question, and frisk. And at what point in time as a police officer who did this in his career is justifiable in putting someone up against a wall and patting them down. You can't just jump out of a car and put someone up against the wall. That's a violation of their constitutional rights. But there is a reason for stopping, questioning, and frisking someone in certain situations. And I think that what's going to happen is it's going to be so ambiguous, it's going to be Monday morning quarterback of all our police. Tom, let's talk about something else. The NYPD is also ramping up counterterrorism. In fact, uh, they started training some officers to use high-powered rifles to take out potential terrorist snipers. Do you think this is just another form of police militarization? Well, in New York City, we've always had officers who are specially trained and able to use either high-powered weapons and or automatic weapons. Most of them belong to our emergency service units, and different cities have the same type of setup. So, no, it's not a militarization. It's preparation in, in the event of a terrorist attack or a, a realistic threat where you might have to mobilize these officers to potentially be on guard against a possible terrorist attack. Tom, there is no doubt, and we have seen terror and a variety of different uh, violent actions take place in New York City. But what about the notion of SWAT teams with military equipment in places um, across the country in more rural settings? Do critics have a point when they decry what Miranda mentioned earlier, the so-called police militarization from coast to coast for every town, city, and hamlet? I think there's a reason to give out the equipment. I think the city officials and police officials and people who run police departments have to decide when it would be suitable to bring that equipment out and to utilize it. If you're having fire bombs thrown at you and you can get into a Humvee and protect you and the other officers or stand behind it as a protective method instead of charging a crowd to break up a crowd and possibly incite more rioting, there is a purpose. But to Miranda's point, again, another good point, you have to decide when to use it and how to use it, but it's a good thing that they have it. I want to get your thoughts. There's been a lot of talk recently about body cameras for police officers. Do you like the idea? I love the idea. I think that, you know, it's not the be-all, end-all. I mean, you know, we watch on TV every night that they solve a crime within 60 minutes. It's not the way it happens. And even though in certain cases we've had video, I don't think you can expect just because a cop's wearing a body camera and just because they get it on video to answer all the questions. It'll help to solve it. It'll help to make allegations against cops more diminished but yet it will also answer the questions of what happened at a certain incident at a certain time and alleviate any of the other speculation that may come out afterwards. Tom Ruskin, we appreciate uh, your thoughts on body cameras. We're glad you were in front of our studio camera today at Newsmax New York to take us through a lot of these issues involving law enforcement and public safety. Thanks so much for your time, Tom. Thanks, J.D., and have a good day, you and Miranda. We sure warm, will. Okay? That's right. Watch out for all those, all those snowflakes uh, falling. Uh, we've got some stuff to kind of leave you with a smile and a yeah. metaphorical pat on our back. We'll tell you about it next.